Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. This is Multifamily Chronicles. I'm your host, Adrian Danila. Our guest today is Lorin Kaut. Lorin is Senior Talent Acquisition Partner for Wit Entrada. Welcome to the show, Lorin. Thank you, Adrian. I'm very excited to be here. Lorraine, uh, why don't you start by introducing yourself to the audience? Tell us a little bit about your background, professional, personal. I would love that. You know, whenever I get that question for me, it's like, it's so loaded because I mean, how far do you want me to go back? But anyway, for our purposes today, um, my name is Lorraine and I have basically a very, um, I'm one of those interesting people who found her vocation very early on in her career. Um, I was in sales for a large uh, payroll company back in the early days, and a colleague of mine went to this thing called recruiting, and she said, you need to check this out. You can make a lot of money. And I was like, what is recruiting? Long and the short of it is, what started out as I had an opportunity to make a lot of money turned into a true lifelong vocation. And it all started when I started uh, placing people at my clients. And I started getting handwritten thank you notes on how that particular interaction, how that position really helped to um, impact their life in very meaningful ways. And time and time again, that I would receive these notes, I said, I, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm actually helping people. And there, and there started my, my vocation. And out of this vocation came um, my career coaching practice naturally. Um, working with people, working with companies, just naturally being able to help others find fulfilling work, prepare for interviews, performance, career road mapping, naturally flowed from me. And so I've done that for many, many, many years. In 2013, I had a pivotal point. I went corporate. Um, I was in the agency world for many years prior. And my corporate work allowed me to kind of play in a different area of recruitment. And I was able to take all of my agency experience and translate that into global talent acquisition from the sense of being able to build functions for organizations globally across EMEA, across APAC. And it was um, at the early years of my corporate work, it was a lot of fun and it was hard work and a lot of learning. Uh, but over time, what I really started to specialize in is helping high growth companies uh, find talent to help them achieve their revenue goals. And so that took me to a number of different uh, places. And most recently, I've been at Entrada now for a little over a year and uh, working with their go-to-market team and helping them with their uh, expansion when it comes to their uh, sales, their sales engineering team, and their revenue operations team. Lauren, uh, would you like to share a little more about your current role at Entrada? Like, what what do you specific? What are your uh, duties? And also share a few great things that are happening at Entrada. Uh, them being a uh, you know being a uh, a great partner for the multifamily industry. I think that uh, the audience on the show would like to hear about some great stuff that's uh, going on out there. Well, wonderful. Well, I'd like to premise by saying, you know, when we look at the major human needs that us as all humans have, it's food, water, air, and shelter. And, and one thing that I love and that drives me being in, the, in now the multifamily industry is that we get to play in a space that greatly affects humans globally and talk about passion and purpose and vision and vocation that regardless of the role that we all play in this wonderful industry, we're, we're playing in a, in a very important space. So I think overarchingly, the multifamily industry is just such an amazing place to be. And Trada, for those that might not know who we are, we are a company that provides technology enabled solutions for the multifamily space. We have an operating system for which we have over 50 products and services that can support our clients, no matter how uh, small or large they may be. Um, I just came off of company and sales kickoff. I just flew back in from Utah yesterday. So I'm pretty hyped about what we're doing. There's more to come. If you're not following Entrada's company page on LinkedIn or Entrada in general, please check us out on our website. 
and on LinkedIn, and you'll see some of the great things that we're doing um, as we spearhead into the future. Um, I play the role of senior talent partner, so I support our uh, chief revenue officer and his organization in finding amazing talent. Maureen, uh, I want to talk about the labor market, the current labor market. Lots of challenges out there. Uh, people, qualified individuals, professionals have a hard time finding the right opportunities. Even though there's a lot of opportunity out there, in my opinion, uh, it, it's just uh, I see that there's there's quite a bit of disconnect, right? Uh, companies really want to hire. They have a huge need of you know hiring new people, and then candidates want to get hired. But things don't, you know, happen as fast as I believe they should, or we hope they would. Uh, there's also a, a lot of layoffs going around, not just, you know, in, in multifamily, probably not so much in multifamily, but all over the place, really. Like we, we've seen this almost on a daily basis, thousands of people being laid off. So uh, I want to get your take on the current uh, state of the labor market. You know, uh, what, what do you see? happening out there? And then where do you think we're going with the labor shortages? There are definitely, I, I think there's no there's no uh, debate here. There are significant labor shortages still, even with so many people being laid off, there's still out there like millions of jobs available that you know are hard to fill. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I've been at this for a long, long, long time. I've been through many, many different labor crises throughout the multiple decades. And here we are still today um, in 2023, and we have we have a, a, a plate in front of us as well. So I always like to say the more things change, the more things stay the same. Um, you know, I can't speak directly in terms of like why all, all the layoffs. I think, you know, when it comes to talent strategy in general, regardless of industry, it's very important to align yourself with a strategy. So when a company has a particular goal in mind, they really need to reverse engineer that, that back to what makes the most sense from a time, talent, and, and treasure perspective and plan ac accordingly. So talent strategy, regardless of industry, today and always will be extremely important. Um, fun fact for us, uh, so I, I went on the website, We Are Apartments, and I'm going to read this uh, quote that if you Google it, if you go to their website, this comes right up. It says that um, in the U.S., we're going to need to build 4.3 million more apartments by 2035 to fill the shortage from underbuilding from the financial crisis of 2008. So just think about that for a minute. For our industry in particular, our industry in and of itself is growing. And Adrian, if it's okay, I'd love to share just um, a quick example of, of how this is playing right now. In 2021, I was working for a high growth company pre-IPO going public, and we were scaling our sales organization and they needed a high profile salesperson on the West Coast. And I initiated a conversation with someone in Washington state, spot on, awesome candidate. She was interested. I was interested. We started to prepare to get her into the interview process. And in 2021, she said, literally within a week of our engagement, Laureen, I have something to share with you. My husband and I decided in a blink of an eye to say, what would happen if we put our house on the market? And so we did. And we had three cash offers the next day. And so now we're renting in North Carolina. So, I mean, it's kind of uncanny what this pandemic has done for our multifamily industry. People are open to relocating now like never before on their own dime. And the housing market has allowed that. Now, has that been changing? Has that been normalizing? Yes, we've seen things happen since 2020. That's, that's kind of, you know, I would say going back to some semblance of what we defined as norm, but the reality is when you look at Gen Z and the population that's coming now through kind of their next tier of their life where they're ready to move out on their own and you look at folks who are employed or not employed and saying, well, I think I can live where I want now. I don't necessarily have to be where I'm told that all affects our industry in a very positive way. How we approach that, you know, that that's going to look and feel a little bit different. But overarchingly, I feel like our industry is positioned very nicely 
for great growth, regardless of what we're hearing on the news about what's happening in general. That's kind of thing one. So talent strategy is important no matter what the industry, our industry, regardless of what you're hearing, I believe just the, based on the data and my experience talking to people, it is really in a growth mode. And so it comes then down to how are we finding talent or how are we making ourselves findable for talent to find us for the specific roles that we need them for? So I think you know, that is the great question. And I think that's strategy both on the side of the job seeker, but as well strategy and, and sourcing strategy on the side of the organization. You said something very, you know, very interesting, very important. You touched on a very important topic right there. How do we get to become ourselves seen? Uh, both on candidates and on the employer side, are, are there a few tips that you have to share uh, I guess either with candidates or with employers that are actually having difficulties attracting, you know, uh, having a decent pipeline of talent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the big question that comes to mind, whether you're a job seeker or whether you're an organization looking for talent is the why. Simon Sinek, really, he went out and he defined why, he wrote a book on it. Everything comes down to why. And that really does translate into this too. So let's talk about it from the company perspective first. Why do you need the person and why would the person want to work here? So that's your why on the side of the company. From a candidate or a job seeker perspective, why are you looking for a new opportunity? And why are you, why are you looking at this industry or why, what is your why? Like, what is your why and your what? And then we can figure out your how. And it's the same for a company too. Like, you know, what is right now job seekers, and this is not, I don't have a specific data point from McKinsey or from Bain, but I can tell you talking to hundreds of candidates a week, when I ask them what's important for you when it comes to a new opportunity, it, the first question that I'm asked is what is the culture that's fostered within the organization? So the people of an organization essentially define the culture. A company can define its values, but how people live those values is really what defines your overarching culture. So what is, what is that? And how are you as the company sharing that with the marketplace? People want to know about the culture, the people, the culture, and then they want to know about the opportunity. So from a company perspective, once you can define, here's the culture, here's the, here, here are the people that make this culture great, here are the competencies that equate to that, now I can better define a, a marketing strategy around how I want to market this job to the, the talent marketplace. On the flip side, if I'm a candidate, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Is that what I love to do? Where can I do this and feel fulfilled? That's where your, as the company's talent marketing strategy comes into play. Because if I don't know this industry exists, and I'll be honest, I didn't know this industry exists when they reached out to me. I have never in my career been exposed to this industry. Have I rented? Yes. Have I paid rent? Yes. Have I paid utilities? Yes. But I had no idea that this was like a whole industry. How exciting to find out that there is, but that's because someone reached out to me to share the news. So the days of posting and praying that candidate pools that you need are going to find you have decimated. If you are in talent recruiting right now, I'm sure you will relate to me that you will get hundreds of resumes submitted for a job spec, and there might be one, maybe two that align with the specifications that you need. I know for me, I have to go out and look for the talent. Talent, if you're just if if you're just waiting for job specs to come and searching on Indeed based on what it is you do, you might be missing out on a huge opportunity. Certain job sites and the functionality behind them scrape from company sites, and many times they give kind of boosted opportunities to those companies that pay. So you might not be seeing all the job opportunities out there. So that's where it becomes important. What do you want to do and where do you want to do it? And then you have to develop your own strategy to finding that. 
talking about strategy, um, I, I want to get to the next topic, uh, Lauren, and talk a little bit about career coaching. You, 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 you know, you've been doing this for a while, so obviously I'd like to get your take on a few things regarding career coaching, right? Uh, what advice do you have for someone that wants to elevate their career? Yeah, so elevating your career, that's going to be defined differently for each person, right? And depending on where they are in their career roadmap. I would share with you that wherever you are in your career roadmap, if you're in a position of, you know, if you look at a typical organizational environment, so if you're in an analyst role and you want to move to a senior role or a lead role to a manager role to a C-suite role, the natural progression that we're taught we should do, then it's important for you to understand the skills, the functionality, and the competencies you need in order to elevate. No longer is it just time and position. Um, time and position used to be, I think, an 80s mentality where, oh, well, I've been in this role for 10 years, so naturally I should be the next one to be a manager. It's more about those areas I just described. How do you figure out what that looks like? Well, the world today is not like the world when I came out of school. You can find out pretty much anything you need by looking online. So I would say if you're in an analyst role and you're looking for that next step, find the people who are in that role and look at what they've done and then kind of start aligning yourself internally where you are and opening up yourself to getting those skills and experience. And sometimes you could get those skills and experience and there may not be opportunity where you are, but then when you know what you want to do and where you want to do it, if you created this roadmap for yourself, then you know that you could go out and try to find that position elsewhere. But you'd be more properly equipped for that position by getting those functional skills and experience that you need in order to, to move. But Adrian, there's a new anomaly that's happening today. I don't want to say it's because of COVID because I'm, I'm really quite sick of hearing because of COVID, we have this and that and the other thing. I really want to call it human evolvement and to really wanting to do what they love to do and do it where they love to do it, regardless of the title. And so I think that comes down to important introspection for all of us in terms of what do we love? And I, I could provide an example of, of one of my clients. And I love this story because this person is much happier today than this person was call it seven or eight years ago, someone reached out to me cold on LinkedIn and said, I need your help. And I was like, well, who are you? I don't know. I don't know who you are, but I'll talk to you. Okay. You know, <laughs> Here's, let's schedule a time. Anyway, this person was at an organization for close to 40, 30, 35 to 40 years, basically right out of school in technology, started with this organization, moved his way up due to time and role to a C-suite position over technology. And in a blink of an eye, a new CEO came into this organization and basically as it sometimes does happen, that whole C-suite changed and he received a package and lost his job. Now, the last time this person had to find a job, he had, um, it was in the back of a, a newspaper. So, he told me the reason he reached me was he'd interviewed for all of these C-suite positions in the area that he lives. And none of them went well, even though he felt he should have gotten a few offers. He said he didn't get any offers and he didn't understand why. And this, I think, example as a side note is applicable because we are in a stage where a lot of folks have lost their positions, either like this or in similar or some type of circumstance. So this applies to anyone who might have lost their job inadvertently, um, not for their, not due to their own uh, own um, things, but through what the company decisions were external. And he went through and regurgitated this story, and I was on the telephone with him. And I'm through the telephone. I was like, this guy is like angry. He can't get over the fact that this happened. And it was very negative the way he was talking. Everything was negative, the tone in his voice. And it related me to kind of a coaching concept that we like to use, um, which has some psychological foundation to it. It's called a triad. And this triad, if you imagine like a triangle, it kind of goes like this. The words that you use, affect your, what you think, how you think, 
which then also affects your physiology and your physiology can be felt whether we're face to face through video or on the telephone. And so I let him vent for literally two one hour sessions. I said, I'm just going to let him regurgitate and get this all out. And then the third conversation that was started, I didn't say anything and I let him open up the conversation and he started with it. Well, I still haven't found anything. I'm looking at all the job advertisements and I haven't found anything that's in my caliber of the C-suite for what I do. And I literally said, are you done? He's like, what do you mean? Are you done? I said, are you done with the negative thoughts? Are you done with the negative words? Because that's exactly how you come across in an interview. So repurposing the words that we use, how we think affects how we present, whether it's on phone or in an interview or specifically how we approach each day. So in a market that we're in right now, I would say that becomes very, very important is what do you want to do? This gentleman found out through our conversations that he really didn't like the high level work. He missed being close to technology. He missed touching tech. He missed all of that. So he wound up taking a senior director role at a company and it was a down. So for the eighties org chart, it looks like he took a step down. He did take less compensation that he was making, but he's still gainfully employed. And he is so happy and loves what he does every day. So I want you to think about that because that is kind of the way people are thinking today. So whether you're in an organization and you're looking at a tis the season for performance reviews, if you're doing a performance review, do a personal performance review. How happy are you with what you're doing with your role? Do you, are you finding great satisfaction because there's other opportunities out there that you might be able to translate your competencies to. And in some cases have a similar title, in some cases have similar compensation. I mean, it really just depends, right? But the bottom line is, is we, we work more effectively when it is, when we love what we do and we love where we're doing it. So that's the culture and the people, and that's the functional competencies that we have and the desires we have are our why for our work. So I hope that answers. I know it was a lot of words, but I wanted to share that because I think it was really important <clears throat> in today's marketplace to really think about when we talk about career progression, how do you define that for you? And you live that for you, not necessarily what someone says you should be doing. I, I think this, this is a great example of you know, career coaching and what meaningful work you know, means for each one of us. It's not necessary, like you said, you know, I need to have the same title. If I if I'm not happy the work that you know I had to do in order to be that person, to be in that chair, probably you know this is not the chair, the right chair for me. I gotta do a soul searching, look within and ask myself, you know, what is that you know makes me happy? Um and this brings me to another question regarding career coaching. Uh, when you meet with, you know, with a client for career coaching, what are some good questions that, you know, you're asking in order to just kind of determine why, why did they, you know, why did they come to you? Like, what is, like, what made them, what made them approach you? And in order for you to basically break down who they are, and what their goals are, what, what are some good questions that you're asking? You know, what's kind of the initial baseline? How do you establish the baseline yep. of, of this relationship? Of course, of course. That's a great question. It's a lot of people don't know, you know, they all say, well, what is a career coach? And, you know, so basically the best question I, I ask is this one. I say, what is it that you love to do? I said, just on top of your head, I don't want you to think about it. What do you love to do? Interesting fun fact is nine out of 10 people will start by telling me what they don't like to do. So I expect that. And if I don't get that, I'm kind of shocked. And I recognize the person for it. I'm like, wow, that's really great. We're starting at a, a place of, of positive energy, right? We could take that now and start to transform it. 
But nine times out of 10, people will start with what they don't like to do. And again, that is that focus on the negative. I think it's because I don't know if it's generational or why that's ingrained in our psychology, but we tend to want to focus on what's not working, what we don't like, you know, all of these things. And then we miss out on all the things we love to do and why and how things are, are working well for us that we could capitalize on and grow. So that really, Adrian, it sounds really simple, but that's my first baseline question because people will reach out typically for, um, hey, my, my career isn't going well. I was just laid off. I want to, I need a change. I work under a toxic culture. I have my performance review. How do I approach that? I have this going on and I'm afraid to go to HR. I get a lot of those general questions, but as you could hear, like that's a lot of, most of that is there's something going on that triggers the person. What we do is we unpack that because that always, there's something that it's stemming from. So there is what's presenting. So I would encourage everyone to think about this. If you're going through a struggle right now, take a deep breath. It's okay because we're humans and we all struggle, but just take a deep breath and think for yourself, like, let me just reverse engineer this back to figure out like, was there a sign that the company was going through a downsize? Was there a sign that my position was going to be eliminated? Was there a sign? And most of, more than likely you'll find that there are signs that get you to where you are, that gets you more in tune to think about them for the future, but also help you define what you want versus what you don't want right? You may love high growth companies, but you want to make sure that you're aligning with their vision and their strategy for their high growth. Are they just hiring a hundred people this year? Or are they saying, Hey, based on our growth projections, it's going to be important for us to hire this way and be more strategy, be more strategized about it. So, um, coming from a place of knowing what it is you want, versus what you don't want helps us to kind of look at the full picture of why you are where you are or where, and so we can positively impact that. Or you might know where you are, you know what you want. Well, now how do we go find it? That, that's, that's, uh, that's quite excellent. That's quite excellent. That's, that's a great, great, great uh, picture of how career coaching works. Uh, I have I, I have had on the show different guests that you know do some career coaching. So, and it's something that I'm uh, I'm passionate about. I uh, on and off coach people too, but not as a you know not not as a side hustle or as a as a job. I just you know try to give them advice, the best advice that I could give them given their circumstances. Um, and think, think about coaching this way. I live in Kansas City, so go Chiefs. Andy Reid is not throwing the ball on the field during the game. Andy Reid is on the side, but what he's doing is he's listening. He's observing. He's around everything and putting strategies in place to help his players initiate. And from what I could see, doing an amazing job. <laughs> Absolutely. Go Chiefs. Go Let's Chiefs. see how they do this here in, uh, in yes. the playoffs. But uh <laughs> <laughs> they, they they have a really good chance at uh, another Super Bowl. <laughs> so uh, the next topic that I want to touch on, Lorraine, is uh, resumes. On average, is known that uh, an employer looks at the resume for six to seven seconds. That is a very short time for us candidates, for the candidates to impress the employer, to catch their attention. So with that being said, what, what advice, what pieces of advice would you have for someone when it comes to, you know, creating, adjusting, putting together a resume in order to catch a uh, potential employer's attention? This is, so this is the art and the science of recruiting. You're absolutely right. It used to be eight seconds, Adrian, but it is getting less and less. Um, you know, unless you're applying to, you know, so USA jobs. So for the government jobs, there's a website. They do have a scanning tool that'll scan keywords. You have to answer questions in a certain way. Their systems use technology to scan and auto reject or move to hiring manager. Your larger organizations, the like in industries that are well known, everyday names, they might have similar, but for the most part, 
companies, applicant tracking systems, or the usual suspects that are out there are not auto dispositioning unless the company inputs certain questions that have to be answered a certain way. Um, so for example, the role must sit in Texas. So they may put a question, where are you located? And if you put in Oklahoma, then it, the system might auto dispo you out. But for the most part, if you've applied for a role in general, your resume is going to attach to a requisition that's in the line of sight of the recruiter, the HR professional, however large the company is, and it's going to come up when they look at their search. So you're asking, if you, I've only got six or seven seconds to catch your eye, how do I do that? It all comes down to the way that the resume is written in terms of its relevancy. So I would say um, the last time I actually applied for a job when I was looking for a job, not for research, was in um, 1997. So I don't typically mass my resume out. I typically have, I connect and I promote myself in a way that's over and above the resume. And then usually I'm getting re my resume requested after I have like an initial conversation. So I would say as a side note, the resume is the resume and applying does not necessarily equate to success a lot of the time because a you're competing with paper b you know how you write that how you choose to write and design that resume is going to matter a couple of key points i will tell you if you're going to put a lot of graphics on your resume like a picture or circles or triangles or that column that has all the stats in there the more formatting you use in a resume, when you apply and it comes to the recruiter, sometimes it comes through with just like dots and lines, like we don't see the resume. We have to literally go down and hit, look at PDF and download it and look at it. So if it's not properly populating in the screen, I'm not saying every recruiter, because where there are some amazing recruitment professionals out there that are going to open the resume to look, why did this person apply? But many recruiters will just send a declination. They didn't even look at it. So the number one is the less formatting, the better. The second thing is when you first align with what it is you want to do and where you want to do it, your content needs to read to that. So you can't send a sales resume for a software engineering job because the recruiter is looking at your, when your resume comes up on their screen, if they're looking for a PHP developer and you sold a technology that was created in PHP, but you never developed it before, but that's what you want to do, like they're going to just decline the resume. So it comes down to, if I want to be a PHP developer, that's a whole other conversation. If I've been in sales, I never touch code. You really need to go through some thought of like, well, where do you want to start to learn that? What training have you had? You know, you might want to take a few steps down to get a few steps up and you might move up very quickly, but that's a whole different, that's a whole different scenario. So make sure you're applying to relevant positions and your resume reads to that position. Um, Let's talk maintenance for a second, because I just had a person I was working with who's been doing general contracting work for a large um, private company, and he really wants to get into more of a corporate type of work, and he didn't, he didn't know how he could translate these skills, and he's done very large projects that involve things like concrete to smaller projects that were around electrical and plumbing. So very certified, well-versed. We talked about multifamily and he said, tell me what that is. And I was like, you don't know what that is? I didn't know what that is, but that, I was in legal tech before. And so he's like, oh, that's amazing. I had no idea that that was an option for me. But when he sent me his resume to look at, I would never send that resume out, right? So how you properly word your experience in alignment with what the company is looking for and the location for which they're looking for it, that will attract the recruiter to pay attention. Um, they'll know, they know, and they, you know, just by looking if there's relevancy or not. If you're a salesperson, 
and you don't have any numbers on your resume, revenue target, growth percentages, average deal size, more than likely the recruiter will pass through because they need to, they want to see that that person aligns with the needs of what their company's looking for. So it, regardless of the position, how you present for what it is you're looking for, I find that a lot of people will just something, uh, there will be an event that happens and then they'll just mass send a resume that was not updated. And that really does show and that's that's why it takes it so quick to to disposition out or you know reject, but we call it disposition. But we would say no, um, but maybe for another position or no. Thank you for your time. Great point. Uh, now I want to touch on something else that uh, candidates have difficulties with. Not all candidates, but a lot of a lot of people on the job market do not have elevated interviewing skills and the first position that comes to mind is maintenance technicians maintenance technicians are the most sought out uh, individuals professionals in our industry currently period uh, i could have probably ten thousand technicians right now in my back back pocket i could probably have them all placed within a week period like it's that big of a need right there so what type of uh, advice would you have for someone that you know doesn't you know doesn't they haven't really developed, you know, uh, highly developed interview uh, interview skills. What would you advise them? Well, I would first say for maintenance professionals, like first off, you guys and girls do amazing work. Like there is a need for you, not just in the multifamily. There is a need for you across any living situation around. Uh, I would say so. Your skills are highly sought after because you have skills that are needed, like that not everybody has. So your skills technically and functionally are important as well as in the competency standpoint in terms of relationship with clients or customers. So you have this multifaceted space where you have to technically know how to do it know what the client needs and wants, be able to translate that into what you need to do technically, but you also need to be client facing and be able to uh, communicate with that end user who you're providing the services to. That's a huge job. I would share with you that in interviewing, it's very much, you know, if, you, if you've never had to do it before, it seems very daunting, but really I want everyone to look at interviewing as strictly a conversation, Adrian, like we're having today. I was excited for today because I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> like, you know, I don't look at it so much as an interview as much as a conversation. So if you can kind of take, oh my gosh, I have an interview out of your mind and say, oh, I can't wait to meet this person. You're already changing the words that you use, the thoughts in your head, the words that you use and your physiology. So it's going back to that triad again that we talked about earlier. You want to get your mind around the fact that you're looking to have conversations with new people to share about yourself, but also to learn more about other things. How you approach the interview um, should be much like you would approach a new, a new a client or an end user. And that is learning. I want to learn as much as I can about this person so I can assess for myself if this is the right position for me. So remember, a lot of times people think interview is one-sided, meaning the company. The company is going to ask me questions because, I, and I need to answer them correctly because I, I need the, the company, you know, I want to get this job versus I really need to assess if this company is right for me. Do the people align? Does the culture align? Um, does the work align to what I love to do? So I'm looking forward to talking to this company to see if they're truly a prospect of mine for a new employer. So you see how I changed that because a lot of people look at the interview as it's strictly the company. It's really a conversation. I used to call it like, it's kind of like a dance. So they're gonna ask you a question, you're gonna respond, but you could also respond with a question. And so preparing for an interview in general, there's a few things to always keep in mind. Number one, do your research. Look up the company. As I mentioned today, you can find it easy, as easily as Googling it. Uh, going on, if you don't have a LinkedIn account, make one. 
please, because there's so much information on LinkedIn about companies and people, about culture that you can find out, but you could also Google it. You could also look on Facebook. Some people are public Facebook. You could find it on all the different social media sites. So um, try to do your research and kind of have a general understanding of who it is you're speaking with and um, ask, have your list of questions prepared for you and questions that don't equate necessarily to pay. You know, pay is becoming more publicized now. I think as we look at 23 and beyond, we're gonna see a lot of states requiring that, you know, the pay ranges and such be publicized. So there's this used to be this mystery around compensation. Oh, I don't wanna tell them when I'm making because what if they have more in their budget? And, you know, there's like this whole thing we used to do, like, how could we dance around this? And, you know, but really it's just like, the it's really becoming more, less, less like that and just more like, here's the range, right? But pay, remember, is not the only thing. Most companies will pay a decent range, right? An average range for a job. So focus your conversations more on the technical aspects. What does success look like in this role? If this, is this a backfill role? What was it about the previous person in this role that didn't work? What was about this person, what, what about this person worked? based on that experience, what is it that you need? You know, so just listen for those things so that you can assess for yourself if it's the right position for you. But it goes back to that triad, kind of what you're thinking translates to the words that you use and then your physiology. So remember that you're in a very, very important, highly desirable position in maintenance. And for you, it's going to be a matter of, well, where do you want to do it? Do you like a small amount of properties? Do you like large amount of properties? Do you like the multifamily industry? What about it? Do you like the student housing part? Do you like military housing? Do you like commercial and the, and the four or affordable and the list goes on. So you have a lot of choices. So figure out you first, be equipped and empowered to know that you're at a highly desirable skill set. Not everybody can do it, period. It's not that they don't want to do it. It's that they can't do it. So you have some great skills to share but figure out for yourself first kind of where you want to do it, do your research and then prepare. If you've never interviewed before, if it scares you, I love to go in front of a mirror. I love to ask a friend. I love to practice and role play with people, find a trusted resource to role play until you can feel comfortable with the thoughts, the words, and then obviously and naturally your physiology. Lorraine, how are you doing on time? We're approaching the top of the hour. Okay. We have an hour set up. Yeah, are you okay. okay to go to go over that? Yes. Because I have so much more to ask you. And That's I would love fine. to <laughs> have the opportunity, right? So okay. excellent. Let's keep rolling. Um, next, you mentioned pay a couple of times previously, right? Um, what what is your advice for candidates when it comes to getting the best offer? How how, how can a candidate make make the best out of a situation out of an offer that's being presented to them? So there's, there's two answers I have for that question. There's the person who knows their value and worth and they know what the market is and they know if, and, it, and if they were kind of reached out to by a, a recruiter at a company and the recruiter says, what are you looking for? They can steadfastly say, I will not move unless I'm at X. It's up to the company then if X is not in their comp range to see if they could get a um, opportunity to go to meet that if they want the talent. So that's kind of person one. I know my worth in the market. The person reached out to me. I am open to new opportunities, but I would not make a move unless I was at X. X may be in the middle of their range. X may be the low of their range. X may be at the higher end of their range. But that, that's the person that says, I know what I need, I know what I want, and this is what I'm going to pursue. And the, most people, though, are on the other side of the equation. And the other side of the equation is going to be, well, how do I know this is what I was making? I think I'm underpaid. I don't know. I think it was, I know a, the National Association, Apartment Association for Kansas City, I know they just put out a salary guide. So find your salary guides to assess where you're at, right? So 
you'll then see the ranges. But let's say it's at an interview. Let's say compensation doesn't come up and you're talking to a recruiter or a hiring manager. They say, well, what questions do you have for me? Ask your questions about people, about culture, about opportunity first. And the last question should be, we didn't talk about compensation. Can you please help me understand what is your approved range for this position? Some companies will tell you what that range is. And they might say, does that align with your expectations? And if your rate, if your number is in there, low, middle, high, the answer is just simply yes. And then you move on from there. If they say something like, um, well, we, our range is quite large. Where do you need to be? You could respond and say, well, I, I'm really open. I'm open to what the market is allowing right now. Can you, is there anything you could share with me? And normally by that point, the person will share some facet of that. You know, I, at an initial conversation, meaning let's say it's a two or three phase interview process, I probably wouldn't go any further than, well, I'm really interested in what you had to say. And I'd like to pursue next steps. If you think, you know, that you'd be open to that as well. And we could talk about that later. So now you maybe need to find out more about the day-to-day -day of the role what are the expectations, all of that, because that'll all filter into what your, your expectations are. Let's say the conversation never comes up and you, for whatever your reason, didn't want to mention it throughout the process and they come to you with an offer. Your answer is always, thank you so much. I'm very honored to receive this offer. Um, when do you need an answer by? And if they say the answer now, typically you won't hear that. Just say, well, I need to take that back and really look at the numbers to make sure that it aligns with where I need to be. But most people will give you 24, 48 hours or so to take that back and look at it, look through all the, the verbiage and such, the numbers. And if the pay is not in the line, it's okay to come back and say, look, you know, from where I am today for what you offered, you know, I'm very honored to receive this offer, but in looking at the details and the expectations of the role, um, I would really be looking for X. Um, are you able to, to meet me there? Sometimes they may say yes. Sometimes they might say, I can meet you halfway there. Sometimes they say no. And then ultimately the decision is then up to you. But the underlying to the answer here is don't be afraid of the comp conversation have the compensation conversation. And then, and, and really the more, again, just like the job search, the compensation, the more research you've done ahead of time, the more empowered you would be to say, well, I'm, or I'm looking for X, you know, or based on the, the NAA uh, salary guides, I, the range should be here and that range is good for me. So do your research, be empowered and uh, don't be afraid of the compensation question. The next topic I want to touch on with you is counter offers. Mm -hmm. If you were to be asked uh, by a candidate, not a candidate that you're interviewing for your company, but as a uh, consultant, right? If a candidate will come to you and say, hey, I'm on the market and I accepted this position, my company has made a counter offer, what would be your advice to them? So since I've been in recruiting, which is a long long time. And you can't tell from my profile because like I don't go back that far. But since I've been in recruiting, I have shared and consulted with people to say, never accept a counteroffer. And the reason I've, and I've stood by that myself, although very hard for me in some situations, this is why, unless that counteroffer is going to improve why ever the reason was you were looking to leave in the first place, it doesn't make sense because you're just then staying for the money. And the people that I know who've accepted counter offers typically have come back three to six months later to say, I made a mistake. Is that job still open? So I really, I say, I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm just saying in my experience, which has been a very, very long time, I really don't uh, encourage accepting counter offers. Like I say, unless the organization is saying, well, we want you to stay. So we're going to offer you X, but we're also going to change these things 
that you said were not in alignment with what you needed. So that's a little bit different of a scenario versus like, we're just going to throw an additional 10 or $20,000 at you. That's the one side. The flip side is if that counter offer was very intriguing and you feel like the relationship is strong enough with the company that you're engaging with, you might want to come back. You might, and I'm going to say you have to, but you might go back and say, look, X, Y, Z just counter offered me, um, X amount, you know, to stay, you know, is there any wiggle room on your end? They may come back and say, yes, they may come back and say, no, I don't know. But you know, you, you people have done that as, as well. And again, in the places I've worked throughout my career and the clients I've supported, sometimes that's yes. And sometimes that's no. So you have to be pre prepared for that. Corinne, for the next section of our conversation, I have some rapid fire questions. Okay. You. Ready? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, books, professional, uh, uh, fiction. What are your favorite books? Some of your favorite books. So that's a great, great question. And so I'm going to refer to a couple that are right here. So first off, I've been supporting high growth revenue organizations. So I'm reading all the books, like the Challenger Sale, and all the books that fall in and around from a professional standpoint, what makes a great salesperson and the competencies that they have. So I find that very interesting and intriguing for me. And it helps me to better hold conversations with professional salespeople. Professionally, I'm listening to Atomic Habits on Audible right now, um, which to me is if you haven't read it or listened to it, it's an amazing book. I bought it for my kids for Christmas because I feel like they need to, they need to read this early on. That's a great professional book. Fiction wise, <clears throat> Well, I, uh, Alex Michaelides wrote a book called The Silent Patient, fast read, mystery, twists and turns, very, very good. And if you like to read Lifetime movies, uh, Colleen Hoover is a really fast read. <laughs> I don't know if they'll agree with me, but uh, anyway, those are just my, my things. But I, um, I love books like on business strategy, Becoming Bulletproof is another book that I've read. Um, the Blue Ocean Strategy is on my list here. Uh, there's a book called Disrupt Her, which is like the entrepreneurial world as it relates to women and how women are like really being really strong disruptors right now in certain industries. For example, that book happens to be, um, if you've... Um, if you've ever bought one of those bidets that sit on top of your toilet, the gal who invented that, she's the one who wrote that book. It's very interesting on how she founded uh, that product and took it to market. So that wasn't a rapid fire answer, Adrian, but there you go. <laughs> it, it, it's all good. I, I, I actually enjoy it, even if it's not a, a quick answer. Uh, next question. It's about failure. Uh, we as a society, I think we're not still at a point where we're so open discussing failure, talking about failure, because all we could see around us, everybody wants to show their success, whether it's on social media, whether you look at, you know, uh, Hollywood, TV, superstars, everybody talks about success. Nobody, uh, well, a, a very few, I think a very few take the time to walk us through. How do we get here? So, uh is it just like something that happens overnight? Like we're just so magically great at, you know, things. So the question is, how did a failure or apparent failure set you up for future success? It is what sets you up for future success, period. Um, if you don't fail, you don't grow, right? Um, that's the opposite of, of, you know, when you fail at something, it means, okay, that didn't work out. Why? Again, that word why comes back into our conversation because true failure means you never ask why, because there was no desire to understand why it didn't work. Um, in, my, in my career, I, you, I've, I've failed a hundred times, but I'd be happy to share with you why I failed because along with that, I would be able to share with you how I grew, how I grew from that. Um, 
I was, I was inadvertently part of a position elimination in 2019. Never had, I'm a four and five always in my reviews. And I was devastated. It threw me into imposter syndrome. It took me a minute to figure out, oh my gosh, what just happened to me? But I can look back on that situation now and tell you that although devastated at the time, because I thought I'd retire from that company, thank goodness that happened to me because I would have been miserable because I would have stayed and retired from that company because of all the great experiences I've had on the other side of that. I can look back because our, our hindsight, I would love our hindsight to not just be 2020. I love us to have 2020 vision like right now, because that would have saved me a lot of heartache. I mean, you could ask my family. I was like, how is this? How, you know, I couldn't believe it. But anyway, I look back and say, thank God that happened because I was able to do all these things. And I still failed along the way. I still had things that didn't work the right way and didn't, um, you know, mature the way maybe they should have but I still learned and grew from that and got me to where I am today, which is in a place of joy, happiness, and living what I love to do. I I want that for everyone. Truly. That's my prayer is I want everyone to do what they love to do, not just a job, but to really actively participate in what they do. So if you fail, if you were laid off, if something negative has happened, please recognize that there's another, there's the other side of that. Um, there's another side that when you do recognize the value of that, you can look back and see, and then hopefully the next time around, you know, that 2020 vision becomes more present than having to look far back, maybe months or years. So what perspective? Lorraine, the next question uh, for you, what advice do you have for a young person that's ready to enter the real world, whether a high school graduate or a college graduate, that they're ready to take their first job, get their, you know, rent their first apartment, you know, or rent their first home? Yeah, I would say they don't teach you this in school. And career services departments, although their intent is good, they don't always really provide a great foundation. In military transition, they have free services to help them transition to civilian. I've been told by hundreds of military professionals that are not very valuable. So here it is, and here it is for us. I encourage anyone that has young kids going through school, please listen to this, this part of our talk. If nothing else mattered, this part becomes important. What do you love to do? How do you want to do it? Where do you want to do it? The sooner you can answer those questions for yourself, you can start building what will be a career for you. You'll start studying the right subjects. You'll start learning the right vocations. You'll start meeting the right people and you'll start developing a roadmap for yourself towards success. There's nothing worse than getting midway through some type of technical training or university training and still not know what you wanna do. And people will tell you, but you're getting this great overarching ed education. But at the end of the day, what if you find out that your call or your passion is the medical field? You know, now you've let four years go by, no biology classes because you didn't, you, you got a general degree. Now you've got to go back to school double or triple the time. You know, if it's a vocation that you love to do, look for what's out there that's using that. If it's technology, if you're doing something, young people, I can't say this enough. If you're doing something and you say to yourself, this could be done a better way, build it. Don't wait, build it, build it now. Get the resources. You can learn everything you need to do online. The world is your oyster. There are industries that you know nothing about that are vibrant, that are impactful, that are doing amazing things for humanity. Go find those. Don't wait for a career fair where only those that were lucky enough to get a place and pay enough money for a booth who knew about your school to show up is there. A lot of times those are the same companies that have been going there for 20 years. And if you were to look at those companies, Glassdoor ratings, or look at their reviews or what people say about them, you might not be giving them your resume. So take it into your own hands and move forward with a plan versus just making a plan based on what's put in front of you. Um, because a lot of times that's a very, very teeny weeny 
it's very teeny weeny percentage of what's out there. But overarching to all of that is just start figuring out what it is you want and love to do. Next question. In the last three years, what belief, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Mine is, the first one would be perseverance, which I know is not necessarily a habit, but perseverance just means that even when you're not having a good day, your goals are set in front of you. And because you love what you do and you love where you do it, it doesn't matter. You persevere, you get up and you do it. You, I work a hundred percent remote. I mean, how many people work hundred percent remote? How easy is it to roll into your office, your home office, you know, later in the day, um, in your pajamas, you know, there's the, the opportunity is there to do that. I still wake up at five 30. I still take a shower. I still put, uh, I have a number of zoom suits over here, Adrian. So today was the black jacket. I've got some others over here, depending on the day. Um, but I put my, put myself together because I want to persevere that even though my environments changed who I am as a professor professional hasn't. And so I persevere all the wantingness to fall into bad habits and not doing so. That is the best habit I could say the last three years that I picked up. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, the last uh, rapid fire question, Lorraine, when do you lose, when you lose your focus or your were you feeling overwhelmed? How do you get back on track? So if it's during the day and I feel overwhelmed, I actually, and I'm in Kansas city, so we're cold right now. So sometimes it's not conducive, but I'll still try to go out. I love going outside and breathing. Um, sometimes when we're in the pressure cooker, we don't breathe. In fact, I would challenge everyone. If, if you're up for the challenge, Adrian, you too, when we finish our, our meeting today, our call, our talk today, when we hang up, breathe in for five seconds, hold for five seconds, and then breathe out for five seconds. We forget to breathe because we're so like this. We're like, we put ourselves in a pressure cooker. We've got a lot going on personally, professionally, things happening. And so we forget to breathe. If you do that exercise and do it five times in a row, you'll recognize what true breathing feels like. And you'll recognize that you're not breathing either. <laughs> I'm guilty of it too. So really being able to breathe and focus on the breath becomes important. I will also share with you that it's okay if you're working remote or you're working in an office, it's okay to step away for 10, 15 minutes to breathe or to go for a walk, depending on where you are in the time of year, or even to have, you know, a book near your desk to say, you know what, I need to take a minute for myself. So I'm going to do my breathing exercises and I'm going to read a chapter in my book. No one is going to not approve of that but it does separate you, especially in our remote world. You have to legitimately put it in your calendar to step away or you will feel yourself uh, burn out. I mean, there are times I know for me, I could start at 530 and I could be sitting in this chair until eight o'clock at night if I wanted to, you know, or if I needed to, but I have to set those boundaries for myself. And I have to fill those time slots with meaningful things that are going to help me be productive for work, but also for my, my own personal life as well. Lorraine, uh, I learned from your bio that uh, you are actively involved helping military personnel transitioning to the civilian life. How do you think that a multifamily industry could benefit from uh, this type of uh, uh, individuals, the individuals that are coming back into the civilian life, especially is, on the maintenance side. Yeah, on the maintenance side, absolutely. It is um, military professionals, uh, first off, you know, I always thank them for their service, um, uh, but they're coming to the table with vast array of skills, project management skills, program management skills, technical skills, functional skills, that are relatable and translatable to traditional business. Um, it's just not represented well <laughs> when they come out. <laughs> it's, a, it's very technical military. So um, 
I love working with my military folks because I'm like the gift that keeps on giving. I was just told actually like a couple of weeks ago from a gentleman who was the master chief in the Coast Guard who had retired from his military service. He's now a program manager for a, a company in, um, in Louisiana. Oh, I'm sorry, now Texas. He's like, you know, I've got 10, 10 to 15 colleagues who came out of the military and I told them what you told me to do with my resume and they all got employed. I was like, well, great, keep doing what you're doing, you know, and all the different things. I had a pilot from the Air Force um, here in Kansas City area, Ole uh, in Olathe is Garmin's headquarters. And uh, so he's working on the aeronautical uh, Garmin uh, machines versus be a commercial pilot, which is what they typically will do, either fly for like UPS, FedEx or commercial. So in our industry, we need to think about how how can we um, and where can we employ folks transitioning out of the military? And uh, we need to advertise in our industry to those coming out of the military that we're open to learning more about them and seeing how their skill sets align. Um, so I, I thank you for bringing that up. It's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I think every industry can benefit from folks who are, are coming out um, based on what they're looking for in terms of their civilian career. Lorraine, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be here on Multifamily Chronicles. This was a uh, an amazing conversation and I could keep going, but also I wanted to be respectful of your time. I know that this is not the only thing that you have planned for today to just talk to me on Multifamily Chronicles. Uh, in, in closing, uh, uh, though, I do want to give you the opportunity to, to say something you didn't have the chance to say during our conversation or to maybe answer a question that you wish I would have asked and I didn't for uh, whatever reason. You asked the most amazing questions. Um, I always hope that, you know, if I can bring value to one person and help one person with whatever it is that they're experiencing with their, with their career or with finding a new career or with discerning a career, then it's a win for me. So I'm just so grateful to be here. Underliningly, I would just like to share that the times of today look and feel a little bit different than the times of the past. What people want and what they want to pursue is becoming a lot more personal than what is designed in an, in an organizational book. So companies need to be open to talent. They need to look at their culture. They have to look at their people. They have to look at what they should and want to attract into their organizations. And then people on the flip side, I can't stress it enough, need to recognize what they want and where they want to do it. And that's where you find, that's where you find a match between person and company. So um, I encourage everyone to take, a, uh, take one or two steps to making your job search more strategic and companies make your talent sourcing a little bit more strategic and open it up maybe to pools that you might not have thought of before because there's a lot of great people in the market today um, looking for good honest work within a good culture. Lorraine again thank you very much for taking the time to be here with uh, with me and with the audience. I appreciate uh, all, all of your uh, wisdom and thoughts and uh, I hope to get you back here soon because I have a lot more uh, way more many questions to ask in a in a second interview of course if you're interested i would love to i would love to thank you adrian so much <laughs> everybody thank you very much for taking the time to watch us today this is multifamily chronicles i'm your host and i hope to uh, see you back here soon have a great day